tell the truth or at least don't lie. And so you can't really tell the truth, but I think you can not lie. You know, and, and that's not even the same as not being wrong, because of course you're also going to be wrong, and you're going to have stupid theories too, and they're not even necessarily lies. A lie is when you know that what you're saying is not true, and you say it anyways. That's a lie, and, and it's a lie that you've decided yourself, on the basis of your own knowledge, that's a lie. You've decided that. That's your own moral judgment, and so it's not a good idea to say things that you know not to be true. And I would say, by the way, as a practical issue, it's also a worse idea to write things that you don't think are true. Because, you know, your, 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 your mind is organized at, at the highest level of abstraction in language. And, and it's important that your mind is organized, because if you're not organized, then you're disorganized, and then things don't go well for you in the world just like they don't go well for anything that's disorganized. And so you have to be very careful with what you say and what you write, writing especially, because it's like, it's focused speaking, it's focused speech, right? It take, takes more intense thinking. So in some sense, writing is even deeper than speaking. But you don't want to speak things that you believe to be untrue, and you certainly don't want to write them because that changes you. And it changes you in the direction of the deception that you're undertaking while you do the speaking or the writing. And you might think, now nah, I can write whatever I want and I can just leave it be, but that's not true. And the reason for that in part is because your knowledge is shallow. And so if you take rather shallow knowledge and then you write something detailed that's false, you end up convincing yourself in all sorts of ways that you don't even notice that what you wrote that was a lie was true. And then you're stuck with that. And it's, it's not stuck with it psychologically exactly, although it's also that. It's stuck with it neurologically, because when you learn things and you make new connections, you, you, re, you change the structure of your brain, and then that's that. I mean, you know, you're, it's plastic to some degree, but you're messing around with your psychophysiology, and that's a bad idea. And you know it's a bad idea, because you kind of know, like everybody knows, that if you want to get through the world, if you want to get from point A to point B, if you want to get to wherever you're going, it'd be good to have a map. And it'd probably be good to have a map that isn't full of holes and errors, because otherwise you're not going to get to where you're going. You might not even know where you are to begin with. And that seems like a bad plan if you're going to undertake a journey, and you are going to take, undertake a journey, because your life is a journey. So, pathologize your speech, then you pathologize the systems that guide you, and then that relates back to rule seven, which is, well, you have an instinct for meaning, let's say, and it can guide you, and you need it. And then if you pathologize it by introducing material that you know to be untrue, then you distort and, and, and warp and, 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 and pathologize the very structure, the, 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 the very feeling that you need to place yourself firmly in the world. And then you can't rely on yourself. And this is a very bad idea because you need to rely on yourself, especially in situations of crisis, you know, when you have difficult decisions to make. And it's, it's like, well, it's not obvious whether I should go right or whether I should go left, right? Because there's a lot riding on both decisions. And so you're sweating it out. Or maybe you have three or four decisions to make at the same time. It's like, you can talk to your friends and all that, and, but you, you're the guy in the final analysis, man. It comes down to you. And if you can't trust yourself because you filled yourself up with nonsense, then you'll make the wrong decision. And then, hey, maybe you'll pay for it for the rest of your life. And, and maybe you'll deserve to as well. And so it's very, you know, you hear now and then at university students say, uh, undergraduates, they say, well, it just, I just write what the professor wants to hear, and then I get a good grade. It's like, first of all, most professors aren't that corrupt. There are corrupt professors, but most of them are not that corrupt. You have to be pretty damn corrupt before you go that far, before a student will hand you something that's well-crafted, 
and well thought through, and you'll actually punish them for it. You've gone way off the malevolent end of the academic spectrum when you do that. Now, you know, maybe you're a bit biased and you'll give them a B plus instead of an A, and it's not like that's particularly forgivable, but it's not a catastrophe. But, so I think it's a bit cynical on the part of the undergraduates, usually, but more importantly, it's like, what are you going to do? You're going to do your whole four-year degree and all you're going to do is write what you think your professors want to hear and you think you're going to come out educated? You think you're going to come out the person you were when you went in? It's like, no, you're not, because you've rewritten a different self and you've practiced deceit with regards to your highest moral faculty, right? Your capacity for articulated speech. You've practiced that for four years. And so then definitely when you come out, you're way worse than you were when you went in. And that's not education. That's, that's, that's the ant antithesis of education. Better not to be there. Better to lay bricks, right? And not, and I have nothing, by the way, against bricklayers. Way to be bricklayers as far as I'm concerned. But at least they can lay a straight brick wall and it will stand up. And there's something honest and solid about that. Much better that than to go and produce written material that, that, that you don't, that your soul isn't in. That's, that's what the damn education system is for, in, in so far as it's not, you know, there to train you professionally. It's to develop you psychologically and spiritually and to turn you into a citizen, you know, into a competent human being. You compromise that because of expediency, an excuse usually. It's, it's a very bad idea. I would highly recommend against never doing it. And I would say the same thing at, at work whenever. It's very psychologically dangerous to say things you know not to be true. A 2019 study published in the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience highlights how honesty positively affects the brain's reward system. When participants in the study acted truthfully, regions associated with positive emotion and motivation, such as the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, were activated. This suggests that the act of truth-telling aligns with our neural wiring, creating a sense of well-being, whereas deception activates areas related to stress and anxiety. This insight into the brain's functioning reinforces the importance of truthfulness, aligning with Jordan Peterson's argument that lying compromises not just our morality, but our psychological and physiological health. In philosophy, this concern with truth-telling echoes the ideas of Immanuel Kant, who famously argued in Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals that truthfulness is a categorical imperative. For Kant, lying is never morally permissible, regardless of the context, because it undermines the very trust that human relationships and society pend on. He believed that if everyone lied, communication itself would break down, leading to chaos. Peterson's advice resonates with this Kantian imperative, emphasizing that when you speak or write something you know to be false, you are undermining your own integrity and distorting your ability to navigate life. Jordan Peterson's central point is not only about the practical dangers of flying, but also its long-term psychological effects. He highlights the disconnection between what one knows to be true and what one expresses. This dissonance, he warns, doesn't just deceive others, but fundamentally alters your own understanding of reality. When you repeatedly engage in deceit, you essentially rewire your brain to believe the very lies you tell, leading to disorganization in thought, behavior, and ultimately, life outcomes. One of the most compelling aspects of Peterson's argument is his focus on writing, which he calls focused speech. Writing, he argues, is not just about organizing thoughts for external communication. It restructures your mind. Peterson goes as far as to say that when we write things we know to be untrue, we corrupt the very processes that help us make sense of the world. This corruption is neurological as well as psychological. The brain is neuroplastic, meaning it adapts and forms new connections based on what we learn and experience. When we reinforce lies, we effectively mold our brain to sustain falsehoods, leading us to a life governed by deception, confusion, and poor decision-making. In the context of education, Peterson's example of students writing what they believe professors want to hear further illuminates the dangers of dishonest intellectual practice. While it might seem like a harmless strategy to get better grades, 
The deeper consequence is a compromise of one's intellectual and moral development. Over time, students who engage in this form of deception are not just lying to their professors, but are also reshaping their sense of self. They come out of the educational process worse off, not just because they've learned little of substance, but because they have engaged in four years of moral and intellectual dishonesty. This aligns with Kant's view that habitual lying corrupts one's moral compass, making it harder to recognize truth when it really matters. Peterson's discussion extends beyond the realm of education into the broader implications of lying in everyday life. His warning that lying creates a distorted map of reality is critical. If we rely on inaccurate or deceptive information, we risk making decisions that are fundamentally flawed. These decisions can have lasting consequences, as Peterson suggests, not just for our personal lives, but also for society as a whole. In this sense, Peterson's advice can be seen as practical wisdom, urging individuals to maintain a clear, honest perception of the world, as this is the foundation of sound judgment and personal responsibility. Adding to Peterson's perspective, I would argue that truth-telling also fosters resilience. When we are honest, especially in difficult or high-stakes situations, we build trust, not just with others, but within ourselves. We learn to face reality as it is, rather than as we wish it to be. This mental toughness allows us to deal with life's challenges more effectively. In contrast, deception may provide short-term relief or gain, but it leaves us vulnerable to long-term consequences, both external and internal. Deceptive behavior erodes our sense of self-efficacy because, as Peterson points out, if we can't trust ourselves, who can we trust? In conclusion, Peterson's message carries profound implications for both individual and societal well-being. The idea that lying disrupts not only our external relationships, but also our internal sense of coherence is crucial. In a world increasingly characterized by misinformation, Peterson's call to honesty is more relevant than ever. His philosophy is not just a moral directive. It is also a practical guide for living a life of integrity, coherence, and resilience. Whether in personal relationships, academic environments, or professional settings, telling the truth, or at least not lying, becomes a means of fostering mental clarity, personal responsibility, and authentic living. In this sense, Peterson's advice serves as both a moral and psychological safeguard ensuring that we remain firmly rooted in reality. I'm curious to hear what you guys think about all of this. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.